Will you please rise for the reading of the scripture? The scripture this morning is from Acts 8, 26 through 39. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candike, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, you may be seated. <clears throat> One more time, let's go to the Lord in prayer. For Lord, focus our attention on you and your word and the Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit that invades all of our hearts and lives. And may we welcome what you have for us to hear and experience today. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight because you are our strength and our redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. My freshman year at Baylor University, I roomed with a, a friend from my high school a, a years that was a couple of years older than I was. And we never really had any arguments. That's unusual, you know, uh, in a roommate situation. Because here's the reason. He didn't engage in arguments. He didn't attack positions with logic or reasoning. Here's what he did. He asked questions. And he kept asking questions in series and listening to my answers to ask the next question. Pretty soon, I would usually begin seeing things from his perspective. And once I noticed what he was doing and said something about it to him, he quoted a short poem I've always remembered. He said this, and I think I may have already said this before here. A man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. He went on to be a lawyer. That's what he should have done. He was in. <laughs> but you know what? That's exactly what Philip does in this passage we just read. He comes alongside this chariot that the Ethiopian eunuch is riding in. And of course, he declares, 
An Ethiopian like you probably doesn't understand what Isaiah is talking about, so God sent me here to straighten you out. No. That's not what happened. He simply asked a question. Do you understand what you are reading? See, he, he asked the man a question directly related to where he was, to what he was interested in, to what he was doing. And I have to tell you, the most effective way to share Christ with somebody else is to start right where they are and to share Christ in the midst of their circumstances. You know how many times we see people, we think they're messing their life up, we don't put ourselves in their shoes, we don't remember all the times we've messed our lives up. How many times we want to rescue people or fix people or straighten people out? And what they really need is somebody to help them see how God fits in to their particular equation, whatever it is they're trying to find the answer to. And that's what Philip did. You start where people are. And you share Jesus with them. Not the church, and not even just the Bible, but you share Jesus with them. And so Philip shows this Ethiopian man how Jesus is the subject that's being discussed in the book of Isaiah. That He is the one, Isaiah talks about, that suffered for us. And then it says they came to a pool of water and the eunuch says, what hinders me from becoming a believer? What hinders me from being baptized and following Jesus? And Philip says, you can if you believe with all your heart. And the eunuch replies, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And they both enter that water. And he's baptized. And as you notice the last verse, he, he rejoices. His life is changed. He will never be the same again. But let's go back to the beginning of that story. We didn't read it, but let's, let's do a flashback to see how we got to this point. Philip, back in chapter 6 of the book of Acts, the apostles are presented with a problem. The Greek-speaking Jewish widows who had come from other parts of the earth weren't being treated the same way that the Hebrew-speaking Jewish widows that were from Jerusalem were being treated. And there was complaints. And they came to the apostles and said, you need to fix this. And the apostles say, hey, we need to be preaching the Word. We need to be praying. You pick six men and let them be, uh, let them be the ones who wait on the tables and figure out how to handle this. So they do. They pick, is it six or seven? Seven, pardon me. Seven's a better biblical number anyway. Thank you. <laughs> Seven men. Okay, and the first two that are listed are Philip and Stephen, and they have important roles to play in the book. Actually, the first one is Philip right here. He's one of those men. He was picked to wait on tables, okay? And here he is, serving and waiting on tables, but here's what I want you to see. Once again, God had a bigger plan for Philip's life. Jesus said, he who is faithful in little things will be given much. You want big responsibilities and big assignments in God's kingdom? Then you start by being faithful in little assignments. That's what Philip did. And God had so much more for him. And so at, at the beginning, that's in chapter 6, at the beginning of chapter 8 of the book of Acts, which we also didn't read this morning, it says quite clearly that there was a huge persecution that came against the Christians in Jerusalem. And we don't know exactly why, but it says the apostles remained in Jerusalem, but the rest of the church was scattered. You might think, uh-oh, that sounds like a disaster. They don't have their leaders with them. But man, the Holy Spirit was with those lay people as much or more than he was even with them. Well, not more, but as much as he was with the apostles. And you see the gospel spread. And that's what happens with Philip in Samaria. Um, and so people scatter everywhere. Philip's in Samaria. And the, um, and the land of 
the dreaded and hated Samaritans. If you know anything about the gospel, you've heard the stories. You know, they weren't well liked by the Jews. So what does he do? He begins to preach. He begins to proclaim the gospel. And God uses him to spark a revival. People are coming to faith in Jesus Christ, left and right. Multitudes of people. I mean, in modern day images, it would be it's similar to like a Billy Graham crusade. Some of you are young enough, you might not even know what that is. But Billy Graham crusade, you know, where he preaches and people, multitudes, uh, respond to the gospel. There was a, uh, a guy named Dan McBride who was minister of education at church. He used to go around to banquets and do parodies and songs. And he told some hilarious stories. He said, when I, when I was a seminary student and was going to preach, you know, I'd be invited to go out to a small country church. They'd have to bring in chairs to seat 19 people, you know, in there. He said, and I didn't know how to preach, so I memorized Billy Graham's sermons. He said, I, we had, I had to, and I was really good. He, the, only guy, the only place I got in trouble was at the end of my sermon when I said, those of you in the balcony, it'll take you about three minutes to make your way down here. If you came on a church bus, they'll wait for you. That, that, that didn't go over. <laughs> but just like Billy Graham and the Holy Spirit used him to bring people to Christ, that, um, that's what happens with Philip. But remember, he's not an apostle. So the apostles, Peter and John, come down to Samaria to check things out. Can it be that even Samaritans can be saved? Are they really included? And they find out they can be. And they are. Amazing. And then, and God does this sometimes, God tells Philip to leave where he is and head out south on a lonely, deserted road that leads into the desert. What? I mean, that doesn't even make sense. But Philip does exactly as he's told. And we see here the importance of guidance and obedience. They have to go together. First of all, you and I, we have to believe that the Holy Spirit can actually guide our thoughts. That He can put into our minds ideas and insights and possibilities and directions which we would never on our own have dared to contemplate without Him. Because, why is that? Because He's God. He knows not only the past and the present, but He also knows the future. He knows not only what we do need, He knows what we will need. He knows not only about our concerns, but the concerns of others as well. And He knows how to put those two things together. And He has chosen us as channels to do His work in the world. The Holy God, the Creator of all, the Savior and Lord, will use you and me. And we can cooperate with Him in accomplishing His plans and purposes in people's lives and situations that we come across. And all it takes is guidance, listening to His voice, and obedience, doing what He says. You see, Philip wasn't given the whole story. He was just told to head down a road. He might have thought as he's heading down that road, well, there, there must be another town waiting for revival services, a whole new group of people to reach. I'm sure that's probably what went through his head. But God didn't give him the whole story. God just gave him the first step. And he asked Philip to trust him for the rest of the story. Many times, like Philip, we are given just enough guidance to change our plans and go in a new direction. I would say that's what happened in my life when I came here to be your pastor. And that's all we need. If we know how everything's going to turn out, where does faith fit in? And so we see this idea in the story of a divine appointment, a godly appointment, a willing Christian and a seeking soul, the Ethiopian eunuch, and God puts the two together. 
And, and what was the Ethiopian eunuch doing as Philip approached the chariot? He was reading out loud from the prophet Isaiah. Now the prophet Isaiah, go, I'm going to ask everybody here, at some time, if you have ever read Isaiah chapter 53 and Psalm 22 and realize they were written seven to 800 years before Jesus ever walked this earth, you need to read it. It's pretty impressive what God has in His Word. And this, this Ethiopian eunuch was reading from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And, and he was returning from worship at the temple in Jerusalem. He was an Ethiopian, a black man, who was a Jewish convert. He'd gone to the temple in Jerusalem to worship, and now he's heading back. And he was returning from worship. And as he did, he had to feel like an outsider. He was made to feel like an outsider. Somebody who could only worship God from the fringes. I wish I had a diagram. But the temple was set up where you had an outer court. You could go through that very first door. It's called the court of the Gentiles. That's as far as he could go. And even if he'd been a Jewish man, because he was a eunuch, because he had been castrated, he couldn't go past that as a Jewish man either. That's where he had to, that's only as far as he could go in and worship. And then if you were a Jewish woman, you could go a little further. If you were a Jewish man, you could go a little further. If you were a priest, you could go a little further. And then there was the Holy of Holies, where only the high priest could go to in once a year. But it gets more and more and more exclusive. And he was just on the fringes. Plus, as I said, his body had been physically altered so that he could serve in the court of a queen. That's why it happened to him. He had a high office in her court, but he had been emasculated. And the book of Deuteronomy stated that somebody in his condition could not enter the assembly of the Lord. He was a second class citizen. And he could never be anything more. I owe this next thought to Fred Craddock, a, 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 a former preacher in the Disciple Church. But it's a marvelous thought. He said this, why does this Ethiopian eunuch feeling so much on the fringe, so much on the why does he keep doing it? You know what he's doing. You do it yourself. I do it myself. He's flipping through the pages of the Bible to find his own name. Everybody wants that. Everybody in the world wants that. I want to find my name. I want to find a verse that I know the Holy Spirit says, that's for me. And I'll write it in the margin. I'll put a date on it. That's who I am. God has found me. Just a little promise. Just a phrase. Just something. He's looking for His name. We all do that. I'm dating myself here too, but it's still a great book if you, if you can find it. Uh, the Cross and the Switchblade, David Wilkerson. A pastor from Pennsylvania, a country kind of pastor, reads in the New York Times, he's a picture of a gang member in New York City that's killed people, been on drugs, and he's going to jail for the rest of his life. And David Wilkerson feels the call of God on his life with no kind of experience for that, to go to New York City to minister to gang members. And he has this brilliant idea of a crusade, and the gangs are actually coming there to fight each other, but God intervenes. And he has Bibles there to pass out as, as, as mass conversion. Lots of them come into faith in Christ. And he passes out the Bible, and there's a Hispanic man who's the head of one of the gangs. His name was Israel. And he starts flipping through the Bible, and he goes, Israel, 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 my name's all over this book. Because that's the truth. We're all looking to find ourselves in the Bible. And what do you know? He found his name in the book of Isaiah. Here's a passage just three chapters over from where he was reading in the book of Isaiah when Philip arrived. So he's reading in the book of Isaiah and he finds it. He thinks he finds it. It's almost too good to be true. Remember, he's a foreigner. He's a eunuch. He's been on the fringe all of his life. And there it says in the book of Isaiah, 
Don't let foreigners who commit themselves to the Lord say, the Lord will never let me be a part of His people. And don't let the eunuchs say, I'm a dried up tree with no children and no future. For this is what the Lord says, I will bless those eunuchs who keep my Sabbath days holy and who choose to do what pleases me and commit their lives to me. I will give them within the wall of my house a place and a name far greater than sons and daughters could give. For the name I will give them is an everlasting one. It will never disappear. Yes, he knew. He had a name, a place. He found himself in God's Word and he knew that God had him on his mind. We long for that to happen in our own lives. And we are to be about, like Philip was, to help other people find their names in God's Word, in God's heart. And sometimes that will put us in uncomfortable places. Like walking down a lonely road in the middle of a desert. When I started going to seminary, I was called to conduct my first funeral service. It was for a 20-year-old young man who got killed on a motorcycle by a drunk driver who had been a part of the youth program I was leading in Waco before I went to seminary. I, I don't want to sound trite about this, but you want your first funeral to be a 90-year-old Christian lady who lived her life to the fullest and was a Christian. And I didn't know what to do. I, I, when, when I went into the funeral home, as for young people who meet an untimely death, there, it was just packed with people. And I felt inadequate. And I felt very uncomfortable. A couple of years later, I was going through my pictures and stuff I had, and I found a picture of this young man with a young woman who had all, also been in the youth group sitting on a motorcycle. He had a big smile on his face. And I thought, this might bring pain, but something told me, Send this picture to her, because she'd like to have it. And I wrote in the letter, um, you know, I hope this helps. And she wrote me back a letter to tell me that God had used me during that time. He used my inadequacy to magnify His adequacy. He used my weakness to show His strength. He used my uncomfortableness to lavish them with his comfort. Fred Craddock again tells this story. He says, I have a friend whose son, a university student, was killed in a wreck. And my friend kept saying it was God's will. And Fred Craddock said, I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it for him to say that this was God's will. And you don't argue with people at a funeral, but weeks later when we were talking, I said, Charles, you, 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 you can't say that anymore. That it was God's will for your son to be killed in a car wreck. Don't say that. And he looked at me with a level gaze and he said, leave me alone. I will say that. He said, what's the alternative that you've got to offer? You'll probably say it was just an accident. Now, which do I prefer, he said, to believe that God knew my son, that God had something in store for my son, that God had a purpose for my son, or your theology that says it was an accident? I'll take mine. Leave me alone. I don't want to argue with you about the theological ramifications, but let me say that story says to us, even in death, people want to say, ah, oh, there's my name. God knows me. People want to find themselves in the Bible. They want to know they are on God's heart and mind. They want to believe that God knows them by name. Will I share it with them? Will you share it with them? Will 
we share it with them? Will we help others find their name and their place? Not only in the Bible, but in the very heart of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Over and over and over in your word, you let us know. You know our name. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. They know me. They follow me. And they know me personally. And I know them by name. So help us to know that truth today, Lord, in our own hearts and our own lives. Maybe some of us are here today. We feel like we've wandered far away. We feel like we, we can't hear your voice anymore. I pray, Lord, today, whoever that person is, if there's somebody here like that, they hear you calling their name. And they know you have not forgotten them. And you still love them. And you still want to draw them back to yourself. And then, Lord, help us to look for those opportunities in the week. To be like Philip. Not to beat people over the head with the Bible or to make things happen that aren't natural. But look for the opportunities your Holy Spirit gives us just to ask a question. May I pray for you? Can I help? Can I share with you what Jesus did for me one time when I was in a similar situation? Help us, Lord, to find those unobtrusive ways to gently share you with others. Help us help them find their place in your heart. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.